Praise the Lord. If he's real good, say amen. amen. If he's still good, say amen. 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 We're going to take a moment together, and we are going to get ready for what comes next in our service here, which is the word. And so uh, as you remain standing, which we don't always, uh, we aren't always standing quite like this, but this is the moment. Um, we're going to go ahead and just let me remind you what we're doing right now, because this is our third week in a series called This Is Us. And we're talking about who we are as a church, what is underneath what we do, okay? Because there's what we do, which is really important, but then there's who we are, which is also something that is worth taking some time. So we've said it like this. I've given you the Cliffs Notes in advance. It goes like this. The first week we talked about it, Jesus is our message, first and foremost. Secondly, people are our heart, all right? Thirdly, and today, hope is our foundation. That's what we're saying, all right? And then next week, we're going to talk about honor is our way. Then we've got Pastor Brian Dwyer, who's going to be here for a week, and we're going to pick it up and end it up with generosity is our privilege. This is who we are. And so my belief is that if we lean into these qualities, we're going to have a solid foundation for us as a church as we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. I can remember a few years ago on a miserable, snowy weekend just like this, walking through a Walgreens near here, and I saw an end cap display in the Walgreens that was filled with sunscreen. And I said, now that is hope right there. That right there. There is some kind, good Walgreens manager, and he told his employees, he said, listen, put the sunscreen out because the people need hope. That's what he said. Because <laughs> some, some, some heroes don't wear capes. That's what I was just thinking about. <laughs> so dumb. All right. We're talking about hope today, and I want to read you a passage of Scripture. It comes from the book of Philippians. This is a letter that Paul wrote to a group of believers in a city called Philippi. The Apostle Paul, late in his ministry, he writes this letter, and he is in prison when he's writing. Okay, he says this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel, the good news without fear. Now, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And yes... I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would add your blessing to the reading and the hearing of your word today. Give us hearts that are good soil, that the seed of this word would fall upon them and would bear good fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated today. It really is cold outside. It's not just, we're not just saying it. It's really cold outside. <laughs> and I do appreciate you taking the time and making the uh, effort to, to be out here today. I, I, I walked by uh, our kids' ministry today, and the rooms are full of kids, and they seem to be oblivious to what's going on outside, uh, which is great. Uh, that's how we want it to be. Um, but in this space today, we have a few moments remaining to, uh, to say, Lord, we want you to speak to our hearts. And so we're going to do that as we are seated here today. I'm going to invite you, if you want to follow along with us every, every week when we do this in worship and as we take time talking about the scriptures, I want to invite you to 
you know, take this seriously enough. Maybe make some notes in your phone. Uh, take, some, take some thoughts down so that later on you can come back to this. And you're always welcome to go back through our app or on uh, YouTube or on, you know, whatever platform you're using for podcasts. You can always find these weekly messages there as well. And uh, I hope that's a blessing to some of you and for those people who are out of town traveling today. We even do uh, broadcast our service. So we, we, uh, this is streaming right now uh, through the app and through... Uh, YouTube Live, actually. So let me just tell you this. Um, in our text today, there's just a couple, of, there's some very simple thoughts that I want to talk about because this was a very, I've been looking forward to this particular week being able to talk about this. Uh, I think pretty, pretty much every one of these weeks is really important to me. Paul has been beaten, flogged, stoned, run out of town, shipwrecked, snake bitten, you name it. Paul has probably gone through it by the time he's gotten to this letter that he's writing right here. So in his service of the gospel, as he's gone around from city to city in the ancient Roman Empire, there he's, he's preaching from place to place, declaring that Jesus is now Lord, as opposed to Caesar, mind you, so which would cause some kind of, you know, it would put him on the radar for a lot of people in, in that place. He's preaching this, and because of this, he's gone through all of these different things that I just mentioned, and now it has made him basically an enemy of the state. He has been imprisoned in Rome, and he is awaiting, uh, he's waiting for Caesar to render a judgment about him, all right? That's the context. That's where he's at at this point as he's writing to this church, these believers that he has visited and that he has invested in over the years. And so he's writing to these folks, and he's telling them. He writes this letter to the church at Philippi and even to other churches like it, and when he does so, we would almost never know. We would, if we weren't able to pick apart from the clues of his writing, we would never get a sense from the tone that he's actually in prison. It's not a sob story. It's not an appeal for pity. We don't get any sense of confusion or disappointment from Paul. What we read is a letter filled with hope and with joy. And that's why this is our text today. And so I have just a few thoughts that I want to give to you in regard to this from this particular text, but that I think really relate to us when we talk about hope being our foundation as individuals, as a church community, and as Christians in general. Hope is our foundation, number one, because hope changes how we view our circumstances. Paul is in chains, but he is not a hostage to his situation. Paul has had his eyes trained by hope to view his circumstances differently, to look underneath what is on the surface. Paul says this. This is one, uh, the, the line that I love. He says, I eagerly, I eagerly hope and expect that I will not be disappointed, that I will not be ashamed. How do I know this? Paul, Paul, Paul's not waiting. This is the beautiful thing. Paul is actually in the midst of this thing. He is offering praise throughout the whole letter. He has these praise breaks at moments where he has to step back from what he's saying and just say, isn't God great? Isn't God good? Let's talk about Jesus and what he's done. Let's just rejoice in this. And isn't it amazing that Paul is not waiting for his deliverance before he offers his praise? He says, I hope and I expect for God to work in this situation. And now everybody around me is beginning to see it that way too because hope is contagious just the same way that fear is contagious. This hope changed how he operated in the middle of a situation that most of us would agree was scary and pretty difficult. He says, my imprisonment, this is the, beautif the beautiful thing, he says, my imprisonment has actually had the opposite of its intended effect. <laughs> It was supposed to silence me, and it was supposed to silence the gospel, but it's had the opposite effect. It was supposed to intimidate me and intimidate others, but instead, it has made the whole palace my pulpit. And not only that, he says, it's made others bolder because they see me preaching unafraid. There's a place uh, that I used to take some teams to when I was down in El Salvador. I would, um, it, it was a, a five-hour hike out of the jungle and up the side of this volcano called the Isalco. That was the name of the volcano. And from the top of that uh, mountain, you could see 
three countries. That was the cool thing about it. And you could see the ocean. You could see the El Salvador, of course. And then you could see Honduras and Guatemala. And interesting, there's no lines like on the maps, you know, that show the borders so that everybody would just have to take it by faith that that direction is Guatemala and that direction is Honduras. But the bottom line is it was an incredible view from the top of this mountain. And the view is always great on the mountaintop. And don't we all love it when we have mountaintop seasons? I mean, where things are going great for us, where everything is good. But let me tell you what I, would I, could, I could tell you about the, the mountaintop. There is no fruit on the mountaintop. There's not any fruit on that mountaintop. There's a great view, but there's no fruit. The fruit is only in the valley. The most important lessons that we are going to learn in our lives are going to be found in the valley of uncertainty, of loss, of disappointment, or of pain. We would all love to live on the mountaintop, but the problem is there's no fruit there. So God allows us to walk through the valley sometimes. Write this down. Before God does something great through me, he has to do something deep in me. Before he can ever do something great through me, he has to do something deep in me. And so Paul has walked through this before. He's been through this valley before. And he knows that God's purpose in this is not, just to, is not to punish him. It's not at all to, to just put him through stuff and see if his, you know, to test his resolve. It's to bring fruit from Paul that is going to actually be a blessing to him and to others. The psalmist said, it was good that I was afflicted. If you ever read that in the Psalms, you'll, you might have to pause and say, what, are you sure? <laughs> he said, it was good that I was afflicted because I learned your ways, God. Paul has walked through the valley of affliction. He's been to the school of suffering, and it has produced in him a hope that has changed his view, the way that he sees his circumstances. He's seen God's victory at work in every one of those valleys and in every one of those situations. So one of my favorite things that somebody said a long time ago, they said this, never put a comma where God puts a period and never put a period where God puts a comma. Your afflictions, and we could talk about that for a long time, that, that could be a whole sermon in and of itself, but your afflictions, and your failures, and your disappointments are not the final word. A lot of times we'll say like this, I, I messed up, period. I'm done. Or maybe we say this, they messed me up, period. Right? And I think we should be careful because for God, it's not a period. It's still a comma. You might have messed up, comma. They might have messed you up, comma, but God has more to say. Paul says, brothers and sisters, you might perceive my situation to be a curse, right? Right? He says, but I have to tell you, I, I don't think that it's, it's time for us to make that kind of, we don't have enough information to make that evaluation right now. I want you to know, Paul says, that actually my chains have served me well. I want you to know that my situation has served me well. Even though it's unpleasant, even though I didn't ask for it, it's not the final word. I am in chains, comma, but God is working in spite of it. Praise the Lord. What about your situation today? What if God was already up working in your situation today? Maybe you'd say, you know what, I, I, you know, I, I, don't have en I don't have enough to make ends meet, period. I don't have, you know what, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess and I'm making a mess of every relationship, period. What if God was already up in your situation right now working? What if instead of looking at it like that, what if instead of looking at it as a dead end, you were to look at it as an opportunity for God to show his strength and his power in your situation? What if he has a purpose for you and for me that ends in victory and in blessing? Let me just uh, say this. Hope produces a stubborn optimism. Now, I don't, I don't think that optimism in, in and of itself is something to be, you know, excited about. Like, hey, just have, a, just have a positive view of life, you know. You know, things might turn around. That's hard for people, you know, like, that's hard to take that view. But when we have a hope that's rooted in the victory of God in all things, that will produce the right kind of optimism in our circumstances to say, you know what, I believe that, my, that this is not the final word for me. That God gets to have the final word in every circumstance for me. It, this is what, it, when, when, uh, when I will tell Ava, our daughter, she's three, when I tell her that she has to do something, she might sometimes, don't, don't judge us here, but she might sometimes say no. And when she really is upset, when we say, no, Ava, you need to do this, she will stomp her foot like that. 
And I will say, Ava, I don't want to see you stomp your foot like that again or you're going to get in trouble. And then she'll go like this. And she'll tap her foot. And I don't really know how to deal with that exactly. But I was thinking about it. Some of you today, you, you, you need to have that kind of stubborn optimism. You need to have some stubbornness in your hope and in your optimism. And maybe you'd say today, I don't know if I've got enough stubborn in me in my hope to stomp my foot like that to my circumstances. But maybe all you've got is just a little foot tap. To defy what looks like an otherwise bad situation. But my suggestion to you today is that you just, when you come into church and you start praising the Lord in the midst of your situation, it's just a foot tap. And then maybe a little bit more, you just get a little bit more stomp. And then you start stomping a little bit louder. And then you follow Celeste and what she's doing. And you start stomping a little bit more. And all over your situations, you just walk over those situations with the hope of God. To say, I will defy you. Because my God has given me hope. Hope in God's power and love changes how we view our situation. Number two, hope changes how we view people. People will give you a lot of reasons to dislike them. At least if you're meeting the same people I am, you might have been tempted to be disappointed, right? And I'm sure I've been a great disappointment to many people. But let me just say this. Things always run deep with people. I mean, I learned that a lot of years ago where I just had to kind of remember all the time. Things always run real deep with people. There's a reason why they are the way they are. There's a story that got them here, however they are. Those annoying ways, those terrible things, that, the, that, that way that they are, there's a, there's a story behind how they got to be this way. Isn't it always funny how we always have a great excuse and a great reason for how we are the way we are, but we don't like to listen to other people's story? <laughs> what we see with Paul is a complete lack of bitterness toward the very people who are doing him wrong. Isn't that interesting? Paul says, Caesar thinks that he sentenced me, but it's actually God who sent me. Think about that. Paul isn't even, he, he's like, the, 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 this is the thing. He's like, I'm not... I'm not even chained to these guards because that was his thing. He would have had to have been chained day and night to a Roman guard. But he's saying, I'm not even chained to these guards. They're chained to me. <laughs> Right? Because God sent me here, all of these palace guards and all of the officials have to sit here and listen to me talk about the good news of Jesus all the time. Before, I could have never gotten to them, but now they can't get away from me. He sees opportunists who are taking advantage of his imprisonment, and he says, it's okay. God's going to use them too. And he's literally rejoicing in it, that there are people who in false motives are preaching Christ. He says, it's okay. I'm rejoicing that Christ is being preached no matter what, even if they're trying to stir up trouble for me. He has no bitterness toward people. He only has hope. Because of his hope, he saw no one as an enemy, but as everybody, as future family. Hope changes how we view others. Hope says that no one is a lost cause. Hope says I'll continue to love you even when you disappoint me. It frees me up to let other people be in process, to remember that God isn't finished with them just like he isn't finished with me. What if, let me just say this, what if you were, weren't actually sentenced to this dead-end job that you feel? What if you were actually sent there to bring grace? What if that neighbor wasn't put next to you to torment you or to test you? But what if he was put there or she was put there to see Christ in you? What if that struggling marriage isn't your misfortune? What if it's your mission that God has given to you to show Christ and to bring redemption to another person? These are hard things. But my encouragement to you is keep hoping and believing that God is able to change people. That's the, that's the foundation that we're building everything on here at our church, that we actually don't see anybody as a lost cause. We're willing to believe that God can work in every person. And, man, that is hard to do sometimes. I'm not just, there are people that are going to test this in you, but that's why your hope and your optimism needs to come from God and not just from, you know, people in your life who, oh, they just, they, they, you know, they might disappoint me. I'm talking about people who profess profoundly disappoint us, we still, Paul had a reservoir of hope to be able to see other people and not project bitterness and judgment toward them, but to say instead, I actually see God able to work in you. Hope really 
helps us to believe that God can change people. That's the bottom line behind what we start this week when we start freedom groups. You know, we, we've talked about this in, for, for a few months now. We're pressing pause on all of our other small groups, and we've started these freedom groups. And the, the point of this thing is that we're all walking together, hopefully getting know, build some friendships and have a nice time and get to know some new people. But in the process, we're actually going to dare to believe that God can change us and free us and, and to hope for one another, to risk being, uh, you know, vulnerable enough to pray for and to believe for and to hope for God's best for other people. That's what freedom groups are about. I think it's awesome because it's based on this thing of I am willing to hope with you and for you. Hope fixes our vision, right? Nearsightedness is when you can only focus on what what is closest to you. And I think there's a lot of people who live spiritually nearsighted in their lives. They're only able to see the people closest to them, the circumstances, the situations. But when God fixes our vision with his hope, we're able to see out beyond the here and now. We're able to look at people and say, you know what? I know how you are today, but I can actually see with the eye of hope exactly how God is going to work in your life so that you will be different. And that is powerful because when we see people like that, they become people to us. You have to see right to do right. When I'm living in the hope of God, there are no lost causes And I would say this to anybody who's here today that feels like a lost cause. You are not beyond God's reach, right? God's reach will always be greater than your run. God's grace will always be greater than our sin. It's really important that we know there are no lost causes. And so we, we have to view others. We even have to view ourselves with that kind of hope at work in our lives. Number three, hope changes how I view my world. Paul had such a strange capacity for suffering. There's no other way to say it. Who else could pen those words and say with, I think, such sincerity, for me, to live means Christ and to die is gain. Why would God put Paul through so much suffering? We have to ask ourselves, why why when God chooses a person, does he not just kind of lift them up and kind of pluck them out of all that difficulty and all that suffering? Why does God allow a person that he has chosen to actually endure suffering? And I would suggest that there's a reason for it. I would say that the reason for this is is that Paul actually had the resource that he needed to endure that suffering. He had the resource. And I would say it about everybody in Christ, that people who know Jesus, they're not the people that run from suffering and from the places of suffering in our world. They're they're people that are actually moving toward the suffering in our world because they're the only ones that have a hope that is the resource that allows them to bear it up and to not crumble underneath it. We are armed with the hope of God. I'm gonna, I'm, I know that it's cold and I know that we're quiet today and I know that you know, it's a little holiday weekend, everybody's off the rhythm, it's all good, but I'm going to say this and I'm going to ask you to say amen at the end of it. We are armed with the hope of God. I'm going to say it again. We are armed with the hope of God. And that is powerful. It means that we have the strength to carry the, the pain and the suffering of our world without breaking underneath it. This weekend we honor Martin Luther King Jr. for his courage and for his sacrifice in leading our nation to live up to its creed. There's a a significant book, one of my favorites, on uh, written about the civil rights movement and about MLK. It's called Stone of Hope, and its central theme, really the premise of the book, is that it is basically telling the story of how people of faith during that season were the ones who had the fortitude and the wisdom to actually produce change without violence and hatred. Its premise is that the civil rights movement was armed, particularly because of MLK, with, with, a, with a potent combination of realism about people's brokenness and about people's sinfulness, but also a hope in God's ability to change. You see, when you don't have that combination, then you fall on one side or the other, either blind optimism or, or basically pessimism and cynicism that would lead you to violence. And MLK said, this is, we have both. We have a realistic approach to this, but we have hope. And this is unique to the Christian faith. We know that racism and hatred are part of the sinful human condition, but we also know that Jesus set an example of triumph through love and through self-sacrifice. 
So MLK many times said this. Uh, you, you might recognize this from his most famous speech, but he actually said it through many of his speeches. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. It was the Christian hope that gave him the enduring vision for a national healing from the injustice of racism. I want to show you just a little bit, uh, one, a little bit of a, a less well-known um, recording of, of him, and I just want to just take a moment and just really take a step back and just appreciate a person who brought hope to our nation because he actually was willing to see through that eye, through the eye of faith. Here he is, MLK. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, How long? Yes, because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long, How long? not long. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, sir. How long? Not, Not long. Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the village oh, where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Lisa. Lisa. He is tipping out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. That's yes. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. That's the Glory, hallelujah. I, it's impossible to not be moved by somebody who at a moment, a real moment in our nation's history, was willing to go live with the Christian hope and to call our nation to follow. It was hope in God's victory that allowed him to write from a Birmingham jail. He said this, while abhorring segregation, we will love the segregationist. It's the only way to create the beloved community. To our most bitter opponents, we say, we will match your capacity to inflict suffering but by our capacity to endure suffering. We'll meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will continue to love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Throw us in jail, and we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, and we shall still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour and beat us and leave us half dead, and we shall still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down. One day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. This seems to me the only answer and the only way to make our nation a new nation and our world a new world. Can you praise the Lord for that kind of wisdom? And in that, I hear echoes of the Apostle Paul. In that, I hear echoes of what we're talking about. A hope that is rooted in God's victory in all things. Thank God for a man who called our nation to hope. What if you and I lived with that kind of determination for our world? What if we refused to yield to fear and hatred and cynicism ourselves? What if we refused to give in to small-minded, small-hearted ways of seeing one another? How do we do that? Well, I really believe that what Paul is saying in this letter, he's saying, hope gives me a choice even when I don't have control. Hope gives me a choice. It gives me options. 
Paul said, here I am in chains, but I eagerly hope and expect I've made a decision. I am not waiting for my deliverance to offer my praise. I am not going to see others bitterness or hatred. I am in chains, Paul said, but I have a choice. I rejoice. I work. I press on. I believe. I love. I have a choice even when I don't have control of certain circumstances in my life. I still have a choice. And you and I still have a choice today. So when we say our church's foundation is going to be built on hope, that's what I'm talking about. As individuals, as families, as a church, even as, even as churches working together, we are going to hope for ourselves, for others, and for our world. This past week, I don't know what possessed me to do this, um, but I, I, I watched the, I didn't watch it live. I actually went back and watched the Golden Globes. Um, and and uh, not all of it, but just, you know, a little bit here and there. It was because I was interested in the jokes, you know. Um, and, and so I wanted to see kind of the monologues and the different things that were going on and stuff like that. But at the beginning of the Golden Globes or the Oscars or anything else, they always have that red carpet thing, right? And they always have interviews with people. And, you know, there's always somebody, Ryan Seacrest or somebody else, who's on the red carpet. And there's, you know, different celebrities who are walking in and they're, they're coming up and he comes up to them and he runs up to them and what does he say? He says, he doesn't say like, hey, tell us what you're here for. He His first line is almost always, who are you wearing? You know, who are you wearing? Oh, I'm wearing Ralph Lauren. You know, I'm, whatever, whatever the thing. Who are you wearing? What's the designer that you've got? Who designed your outfit, your clothes, whatever else? And this is the thing. I, I love what, what, what Paul says in a different letter to the Galatians. He says this, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. All of you are, are wearing Christ. The hope, the humility, the love, all of that that is in Christ Jesus, that's the wardrobe that you and I wear, right? So let me ask you this. Who designed what you're walking in today? Who designed what you are walking in today? Who are you wearing? Because if you're in Christ, you're supposed to be clothed with humility, with love, with hope, with, with, with all of the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit at work in our lives. That's what you're supposed to be wearing. Will you today put on Christ is the question. Because I don't think that you and I can live with this kind of hope and stubborn optimism apart from Christ. Some of you today, that's, that's, that's the first step you need to take. And we could talk about hope for our world and we could talk about all these other things, but your first step is to put on Christ. Because for one reason or another, there's a disconnect between you and your heavenly Father. The Bible says that every one of us has sinned and we all fall short of God's glory. The Bible's really clear that, that you and I, no matter how much good we do, no matter how you know, faithful our church attendance is, attendance is, no matter how generous we are, all of those things, they still fall short. We can't be good enough to earn what we have violated from God. And so the Bible says that God did for you and me what we couldn't do for ourselves when he sent his son Jesus to live the life we should have lived, and to die the death that we deserved to die. And so all that's left for you and me to do today is to put on Christ.